Welcome to the Student Pilot Podcast. My name is Simon Callis, a flight school owner. Each week, myself and my guests will be talking all things flight training and beyond to help inspire, motivate and support you on your journey to becoming a private or commercial pilot. Okay, welcome to the podcast, everybody. Today, we're talking about technology in the cockpit, good, bad or indifferent. So technology advances, we're seeing more and more um, options available to pilots in terms of equipment. This could be glass cockpit, flight planning, um, apps and programs, GPS navigation, collision avoidance, safety equipment, recording equipment, autopilots, all kinds of stuff available these days. So for the majority of us who trained on aircraft like C-152s, like I, th- I think you did as well, didn't you, Steve? On I one? did, yeah. I was yeah. all obsessed on 152. So 152. Um, you know, the most technologically advanced thing on that is probably the carb heat knob. <laughs> it's, um, you know, there, there isn't much technology in his old aircraft, which I think in some respects is a good thing. Um, but do we need to move with the times? You know, we tested um, in 20, was it 2021? I think it was 2021. Would have been 2021, yeah. Yeah, it was prior to lockdown. Um, we tested the Pipistrelle virus, um, or virus, which is quite aptly named at that point but um virus uh, sw121 which is possibly one of the best equipped training aircraft on the market at the moment um and we were quite blown away by the equipment levels on it weren't we yeah um so that particular aircraft just to mention a few things because it has a long list of features but it did have a three-axis autopilot with auto leveler it had ballistic parachute system um garmin g3x touchscreen glass cockpit just to name a few of its uh, many features so the question we're asking today is is technology in training specifically a good thing so let's cover some of the pros and cons of the different areas we just spoke about so let's go with glass yeah glass copy i think first steve if that's okay with you yeah um so incidentally, we are training one of our own students on their own glass cockpit equipped aircraft at the minute, which um, is, is interesting. Um, so some of the pros we would say about the uh, glass cockpit at the moment, um, we'd say if, if you're planning on transitioning onto other aircraft, you know, where you're frequently flying glass cockpit, then obviously it gets you ahead of the game in terms of understanding its functionality. And it's a distinct advantage if you're planning to transition onto commercial afterwards because pretty much everything you're going to fly is going to be glass cockpit post ab initio uh, we spoke to derek about this yesterday his opinion is that um, instrument training is easier as the scans easier or the information's in a more localized area and integration of other systems such as engine monitoring and, and audible and visual warning systems integration of radio and navigation functions in the control panel uh, integration of modern features such as not needing to align the DI and compass, which is what a lot of students f- forget to do, yeah. um, which can lead to, to mistakes. Um, integrated checklists as well. So you, your checklist can be integrated into the display. Um, ADSB traffic warnings overlaid, terrain avoidance, um, better clarity of display for night flying as well. Where you can actually see it for a start. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Unlike so, some uh, steam gauge. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, everyone's flown a, a steam cage aircraft at night where you have to tap something for a light to come on or just shine your torch on it, I'm sure. But yeah, there, there are a lot of pros to glass cockpit. Um, let's go through some of the cons, though. So for ab initio training, um, it can be a distraction from visual flying. So I think you found that with your... Oh, we, we see this all the time. So, I mean, in steam gauge, you get people focusing on the instruments. Yeah. Um, and it's just a thousand times worse with the, the glass cockpit. So you've got all this um, information displayed in front of you. So yeah. people just flying along, sort of looking at it, but yeah, nothing's yeah. changed. You still fly the aircraft by looking outside. Absolutely. Um, so absolutely a big distraction there by yeah. um, just, just staring at it because there's a lot going on on the screen. Yeah, and also there are a lot of audible alerts and things, which obviously they're there for a reason, but they can be a distraction in in certain instances. And we've got a particular instance, which we'll talk about at the end. So we we think it may be a steeper learning curve to understand the functionality over a normal analog system, um, because everything's controlled through these panels that you've got to kind of learn. Absolutely, and it's all layered on top of each other. So, you know, you've got two screens to do everything that 
individual sort of units doing an aircraft. So you've got menus upon menus upon menus. Yeah. And it, it is a big learning curve. Um, I wish I'd have brought it in, actually, but I've got the... Um, the guide to the G1000, it's, yeah. it's probably about, I don't know, 10 centimetres thick. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah. So it is. there's a complexity to it, and I think that you need to understand that, you know, in detail. Um, also, there's the redundancy um, features as well. So, you know, you're going to have limited redundancies, so you need to learn how to use those properly. So some aircraft, they have uh, just a couple of, like analog instruments, don't they? Um, and yeah. then one aircraft we use at the minute, I don't think it has any analog, does it? It's just the G5, is it, back up? Yeah, so um, traditionally you've, you've had to have, because uh, by law you have to have a backup set of instruments. Yeah. Um, they've been mechanical. So what they're doing now is having um, an integrated sort of G5 unit or something like that. Mm -hmm. So a Garmin G5 is a little um, sort of artificial horizon with different information on. Yeah. For those who aren't aware of the terminology, and they have those with an independent power supply. Mm, okay, so you've still got that, but it's still technically glass, isn't it, really? It's um, the backup. It is, and it, it's yeah. fallible, the thing with that, because it still has a power supply. Yeah, exactly. So it's got its own, but that that's yeah, fallible. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so the next thing is is the cost so obviously the cost to acquire these type of aircraft with the um, glass cockpits and things is much higher than analog so that will reflect in your training cost per hour as well so anybody flying glass cockpit is sure to be paying a lot more money for that privilege um, they can be difficult to read in, in bright sunlight and some of the earlier systems they can, and a thing I'll add to that along the same lines is um, polarised sunglasses as well yeah so um, if you've got your sort of fancy Ray-Bans or your aviators, if they're polarised, you can actually struggle seeing these screens in that sort of light. Um, yeah. But yeah, as, as Simon says, the bright sunlight as well, um, sunglasses aside, yeah. We had um, an interesting conversation with Derek about that, uh, where he's got graduated glasses now, sunglasses. Mm. Uh, to, so basically, it, it doesn't have so much darkness, if you like, at the lower yeah. end of the, the lens. Um so possible further training needed to fly analog equipped aircraft. So imagine you've done your um, ab initio training on a, so let's use an example, a glass cockpit 172. Then you want to go and fly one with analog instruments a bit older, maybe at some, you know, another location. You're going to need some sort of familiarization training um, to fly analog, I would so imagine. It's actually a CAA requirement. So yeah. it becomes differences training. Yeah. Um, so that would have to be done formally and signed up in your logbook. Okay. Uh, little known fact, but yeah, if you learn to fly in the glass cockpit, then um, just like you would need differences training to go from analog to glass cockpit, you need yeah. differences training to go from glass cockpit to analog. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, okay, so uh, we spoke about minimal redundancy. So, you know, obviously if these if you've got G1000, the two screens go down, maybe you've got a G5 to use, or, or you know, you've got the analog. Uh, what's the minimum analog they need in there? Um, so airspeed is one, isn't you've it? You've got to have, I think, an attitude indicator, a airspeed indicator, and an altimeter, and some sort of compass as well. Yeah, yeah, fine. Um, so in the aircraft you're referring to, the manual compass is actually an option. So the wow. backup for that, as designed, would have been on the G5 as well. Um, so, yeah, I think there's definitely more to go wrong in terms of your understanding of how to use it in the air, and more to go wrong in terms of failures. Uh, I think generally glass is quite reliable. I know a lot of people are moving from analog instruments to G5, for example, because they tend to be more reliable than the gyroscopic instruments. But if you're totally reliant on glass, I think you could be in for trouble at some point. Yeah, I mean, they, they are complicated. I mean, I myself have had a few situations where, um, the, you know, there's there's sort of warnings that have come up. Yeah. I was just trying to think what it was. Some sort of acronym yeah. um, has come up. No idea what it is. It could mm -hmm. be important. It might not be. Um, so you have to get it investigated. That's time. Um, read the book. But a, another interesting one to do with the complexity um, is that me and Derek, who are teaching their student in his mm. uh, own aircraft, which has got a G1000, we had um, a couple of instances, both of us, where we're just flying along, and mm. then all of a sudden... The autopilot engages and it starts flying itself right. um, for, you know, no reason we could work out. Anyway, 
uh, we, we found out that it was actually a safety system. So I think it was APS, Advanced Protection System, right. that was actually an option on the aircraft. Um, we didn't know it had it. Mm. Um, and that's what it was doing. So it was sort of detecting high angle of attack, which happens in a training situation if you're doing stalling or something. Yeah. And thought it was helping by taking over. Wow. But it just goes to highlight you've got all these features. Yeah. And yeah. both me and Derek had done a lot of reading on this aircraft. Yeah. Um, still not aware. And yeah, and we still yeah. weren't aware of it because yeah. it was an option. So it wasn't in the sort of base documentation. Yeah. And I think that's the danger with aircraft, isn't it? Because you've got so many systems that are not they're not necessarily designed to work in unison completely you know that you have to know every single system on the aircraft and what its redundancies are and what it does in a failure mm-hmm. situation it's, uh, as you can imagine i mean this was quite alarming we're flying along sort of teaching and all of a sudden it goes autopilot engaged and yeah. it starts flying itself <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so let's move away because this is only supposed to be a, a quick you know brief thing we may actually go into a bit more detail on on the glass cockpit element of it in in the aviator show uh, perhaps and we'll go and have a look at this aircraft and, and show people what it's about but let's look at the next one so we covered glass cockpit the next one we were talking about was the advancement in flight planning software and gps so i know that when i first started to learn to fly um gps was there i think so certainly like 430 garmin 430 was there not in the 152s at that point. Um, but apps and, and things like Sky Demon, they didn't exist. And I remember coming back to, to flight training after a long break and everyone was talking about Sky Demon. I'm like, what the hell are you going on about? And then when I saw it, I was like, oh my God, this is great. You know, it's, it makes everything so much easier. But I think all these things, they've all got pros and cons. So let's let's talk about those. So pros of, of GPS and um, Sky Demon generally, I think, um, is the airspace and, and terrain awareness. I think it's a great tool for keeping you out of trouble. You know, it's... It is, and that's what it's designed for. So, um, I mean, we use Sky Demon as an example. Obviously, we're not sponsored by Sky Demon or anything yeah. like that. There are other ones. Um, but... Uh, yeah, it was originally designed for airspace awareness, yeah. and that's its intention. Um, so for that, it's fantastic. So there are other ones, aren't there? I know Archie uses ForeFlight, which... Archie uses ForeFlight. There's also uh, Airbox, yeah. which as far as I know is another UK-based one. So ForeFlight's American, I believe. It is, yeah. Um, so... It, it has got some more advanced features than Sky Demon in terms you can use it for instrument flying as well, which you can't with Sky Demon. But, um, you know, there are lots of different options out there anyway. But Sky Demon for the UK generally is, is widely used and, and respected. Uh, I know uh, we kind of encourage the introduction of it into flight training, which the CAA are also talking about, aren't they, at the moment? But I think you just need to be aware of what it does. So let's let's go through the you know, finish going off through the pros. So we've got airspace and terrain awareness. We've got integration of weather and no tams into the route, which I think is another great thing that you can keep checking your weather on route and things like that, and you can see any no tam updates. Um, you can add additional things to it for collision avoidance as an add-on. Um, it's a separate unit that, that communicates and displays on Sky Demon, which is called Sky Echo. Uh, which does ADS-B and FLAM for gliders as well. So that, I think, is a great add-on. You know, if you imagine you're going into your 1972, whatever it is, 152 with, you know, just basic equipment, a radio and a MODES transponder. Now you've got GPS, you've got ADS-B, you've got FLAM, everything, um, all in one place. And the CAA did a rebate on that. They did, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um so yeah, I think it's still available. Perhaps it I'm might. not sure if it still is. Yeah, but it they extended be, it, yeah. didn't they? Yeah. Um, so next thing is ease of flight planning. So we don't encourage people again to do their flight planning on Sky Demon, um, but it's a good way of checking your flight planning. You know, if you do your flight planning on paper and you just want to check your headings are, are you know pretty accurate and things like that, you could then plot it on Sky Demon with the current wind and see how it pans out and it's a good way of checking it these systems are portable obviously you can use them on your phone you can use them on ipad you know uh, ipads on tablets um so they're portable you can switch them between aircraft they're not fixed to one aircraft so on, on that basis it's a really low cost to entry 
compared to other units and their personal units. So you take them home, you can configure it exactly how you want. So it's easy to get in the aircraft and use it. In fact, I had a, a funny story the other day when uh, I went flying with one of our newly qualified PPLs who um, I was using my Sky Demon, she was using the Hair Sky Demon. I completely forgot that I always fly 172, mine was configured to 172, and uh, we, we were late back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the penny dropped during flight. That yeah, I'm not in a 172. But yeah, so silly things like that can catch you out, you know, because you configure it how you want it. Um, another great thing about it is is the ability to zoom in on the charts and display great detail. So if you want to have a bit more information about the area you're overflying or even the aerodrome, you can zoom right in on the aerodrome and even get to taxiway kind of level where you can see what's going on. Some of them display the circuit pattern as well, which is good, isn't it? A good feature. And you get the airport plates integrated as well. So if you want to check up on, you know, if you have a diversion and you want to check up on the uh, airfield layout, you can check it midair. Also, it gives you an ability to actually record your flight logs um, so you can watch them back. So, you know, if you did make a mistake or whatever on your nav route, you can see how well you tracked the actual intended route. Um, so there's lots of pros to it. And also one thing which I haven't noted down here, but it's just sprung into my head, is that if you use flight simulators at home, you can use Sky Demon in conjunction with your, your flight simulator. Yeah, you can. And we've, we've done that here. It's quite, yeah. uh, quite, it's quite useful. Yeah, 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 it gives you a chance to practice it. So if you're like, for example, on your flight sim and you're practicing a zone transit through, let's use Birmingham as an example, the visuals aren't that great generally on flight sims. They're okay, but it makes dead reckoning difficult. So you could check your track um, on, on Sky Demon. So let's go on to the cons then of GPS and Sky Demon so that it can form an over-reliance on these systems. So especially, you know, after you pass a lot of people, including myself, I'm guilty of this, um, you can not necessarily stop doing the manual things, but you become more reliant on the technology and less conscious of what you're actually doing. So it can decrease your situational awareness and dead reckoning skills so we always recommend that you learn and practice dead reckoning skills um, and, th and this for me is the biggest the biggest yeah. issue with it so the people they go with just with sky demon they've planned it all on plan sky demon and you know okay we'll talk about in a minute why that could be a bad idea it, it is mm. fallible it can fail but you're following that magenta line you've no idea where you are yeah no idea where you are so even if your dead reckoning skills are sharp yeah usually they're not because people yeah. are relying on sky demon. let's say they are you got to have a starting point yeah so yeah that that for me is is the big one so just focusing on this yeah. and um, not knowing what's going on around you and where you are more i think the the key one of the key learnings i had on a flight was um I lost my Sky Demon. I can't remember why now, but it wasn't working properly and I had to resort back to the chart. So what I would say is if you're going to use it, take a plug with you and follow it with the chart so you know where you are at any given time. And if it does fail, obviously you've got a redundancy then in your manual skills. Um, but for training purposes, obviously we don't recommend using it it's there as a backup yeah and and even after training i'll go a step further and say that it's just a supplement to dead reckoning Absolutely. dead reckoning needs to be your primary yeah um that one's just there to to supplement it and you know help you find your position and as we said before the airspace awareness yeah so i mean actually, the, the, the raw skills are really important because these yeah. you know failure rates are high on these devices so you've got to think you've got a cheap you could be a cheap chinese tablet for example or an ipad whatever these things run out of battery Okay, so you need some redundancy for that. I would recommend taking a power cable that you can plug into the aircraft or a battery pack or even a second device. Okay, um, they overheat, power supplies fail, you can lose GPS signals, all kinds of stuff. And I've had two devices go down in one flight um, before, so it's, it's high failure rates in my opinion. Um, so possibility of losing GPS service, it happens. Okay, it could be the device, or it could be the, it could be the satellite. You know, you could. There, there are things that um, can cause you to lose that service, or it could be something stupid like your your pad, your iPad, or whatever it is starts updating something, and then you lose. You know, it can happen. So um, definitely 
have that redundancy. The GPS needs a clear, the way it works, it needs a clear view of the sky. Yeah. But obviously you've got, got a, you've got a roof in the way. <laughs> yeah. So that's the problem with that. Um, you know, all fitted units, they've got external oh. antennas. On the roof. On the roof. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so that's the biggest problem with that. And then we've got inaccuracy of data. So, well, this goes back to my example a minute ago where I was flying as a passenger in a 152 um, with my iPad working um, configured for 172 because I'd completely forgotten I'd configured it for that aircraft, which I always use. I mean, obviously that person's doing the navigating anyway, so it's not an issue. But for a second, I was thinking we're not quite where we should be. So inaccuracy of data. And also they, they have a lot of generic um, aircraft settings in there, don't they? So yeah. you, you want to kind of check those against the POH of your aircraft to make sure it fits because you don't want to be simulating an aircraft that isn't the same as yours. You know, there are lots of different types of Cessna 152, for example. Um, next thing as, as well with the inaccuracy of data is not updating the database. So if you don't do that, there might be airspace that's been... Um, updated and that kind of stuff which should be on your chart if you've got a an up-to-date chart which is a legal requirement by the way you should have an up-to-date chart on board but please make sure that your sky demon is also up to date because you, you may miss something so next thing is um, in the cons is the mounting systems for these um, these devices so um, a lot of these devices are on sucker mounts or you can get yoke mounts for things. Now, all of these are non-standard mounting systems. So if you sucker it onto the window, you might be limiting your visibility somewhat. Um, if you put a yoke mount on, please be really, really careful that you, you check that you've got full control movement because that you know, that's going to be a problem. And secondly, make sure that the, the iPad isn't actually touching things like PTTs because I, I actually went on a flight with somebody once and I kept seeing the, the transmit thing going like every now and again on the radio and I was thinking what the hell is that it's the corner of the iPad touching the PTT <laughs> so you've got to you know you've got to be careful with this stuff um, charging cables as well you know I've seen some cockpits and Steve you've got a funny story you'll share with me in a second yeah but I've seen some cockpits, it's like a maze of wires. People have got wires coming out their GoPros, wires coming out their iPads, wires going into this. They've got phones on charge, all kinds of stuff. It's just creating a bloody cable hazard. Um, and then the, the last thing before Steve tells us is the uh, cons of, of Sky Demon and, and iPads and things. Um, is if you use Sky Echo, which is the device you can get uh, for ADS-B and FLAM, which overlays on your Sky Demon, it is a separate device, okay, and you, you have to have something like Sky Demon for it to overlay on. So, Steve, please tell me your funny iPad story. So, years and years ago, um, I was going to check out a PPL holder. I think it was his um, biannual flight with an instructor. Um, and we're in a 152, um, one that was just a standard 152, not particularly well equipped. Um, so I sent him out to check the aircraft and he goes, do you mind if I put my um, put my iPad in or put my equipment in, I think he said. And I was just, you know, thinking, oh, he's got a little iPad with him or something, which is not uncommon. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So anyway, a few minutes later, I go out to the aircraft and it, it was like the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> we went in there, there were screens everywhere. There was no less than seven tablets in there. Seven? Seven tablets what? just everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> they're mounted to both yokes. They're mounted to, like, there's a couple on the screen everywhere. Yeah. Like, mounted to the panel. I said, like, well, why have you got all this? And he says, well, I can't fly without it. I said, what do you mean? You can't fly without it? And he goes, oh, well, I don't know where I am. I was like, well, <laughs> one, we need to address that immediately. And two... Why did he need seven? What? Like, oh, oh, what? one breaks. Like, oh, what was okay. on these seven iPads? Did oh, have, there was all sorts of had Netflix Sky on, Demon, and yeah, I, I don't know if I'm honest, I've ripped them all down. <laughs> 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 uh, not flying around with most that most people don't even own seven iPads let alone have them to put in an aircraft but, mm. uh, but interesting anyway so ne next thing is so we'll move on from um, Sky Demon and GPS obviously we've we haven't really gone into GPS systems in aircraft because they you know some people have retro fitted ones it could be anything from you know, like your Garmin 430s up to your G1000s and all that, and, you know, G3X and all and that. And the Garmin of. areas as well. Yeah, Garmin. So Garmin, interestingly, they do a mobile 
it's almost as good as an integrated system, isn't it? Oh, it's, they're really good, yeah. It's, it's amazing. It's got, like, synthetic vision, everything. It's great. Um, but they are, God, I think they're about 800 quid, 700, 800 quid. Well, they're certified, so, yeah. They are certified, yeah. So that's the difference. It is certified. Um, so you can get those as well, but generally as an entry-level system, Sky Demon kind of does it, doesn't it? It's, um... So let's move on to safety equipment then. So we're going to go back on to Sky Echo. So, again, that is... You know, we've mentioned it earlier on, but it is really, really good um, in terms of, uh, and it's getting better as well, um, in terms of collision avoidance. So it gives you information, um, ADSB information um, about aircraft that are, are transmitting and uh, positions those aircraft with, um, how, how much information does it display? Because you've, you've used it, haven't you? With... Yeah, I've used it. Um Difficult to answer because it depends. Yeah. Um, so it, it's only as good as the information it's getting. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of, there's a lot of aircraft flying around out there without any sort of ADSB um, and tra you know transponders and things yeah. like that. So it, yeah, it is only as good as the information it gets. Okay. Um, so there's a lot out there. I've got the equipment it can pick up. But with Flam, I guess it's good. Gliders are terrible to see. So yeah, but again, as far as I know, it. not all of them don't. So yeah, I'm yeah. not a glider pilot, but as far as I know, not all of them carry Flam. But yeah, it's yeah. Better, certainly better than nothing. I think so, and I think I think at some point ADSB will be mandated on it. It's got to be. Oh um, yeah, yeah, it's got to be. So next thing, which I think is a real uh, decent advancement in safety, anyway, is the ballistic parachute systems, the BRS systems. So I'm not sure whether they pioneered it or whether they were even the first to use it, but I think it it became noticeable on the Cirrus SR20 and 22s, wasn't it? Is yeah. that they were the people who were first kind of using it. And now it seems to be that all of the new ultralights, the Eurofox, the Pipistrals and things, they all seem to be having it as an option or, or fitted. Quick scholarship update. So last year we gave away one place to our candidate at Cywell, Leo. And this year we're planning to do the same. We're planning to give away at least one place. If you want to be considered for a scholarship place, you need to register your interest via our website, almac.co.uk. You'll be updated as to all of the upcoming events to do the scholarship. Those events will be aspiring pilots days. You will need to attend at least one of the aspiring pilot days to get your chance to apply for a scholarship place. So go on the website now, almat.co.uk and register your interest. Um, so I think, I think all new aircraft are going to go down that kind of route, really, um, which I think is a, a good thing. Yeah, That's I mean, I, th thing. I think it'll be an option, certainly, on mm. a lot of new models. And then um, onboard ELTs. So, um, and PLBs as well. So back when I first started, ELTs weren't really a thing. And PLBs, I can't remember carrying them, to be no, honest. No, well, they, I mean, it's come in relatively recently. Yeah. Um, the, Can you explain them, Steve? Them. Um, so an ELT is an emergency locator transmitter, and a PLB is a personal locator beacon. Um, essentially, they do the same thing. So um, if you have an accident, you can activate it or it'll activate itself, which we'll talk about in a minute. And it pings out a um, distress signal that uh, the emergency services can track. Uh, the difference between the two is that an ELT tends to be fitted to the aircraft. It's usually yeah. a bigger unit. Um, and quite often they're activated by impact. So if it mm -hmm. feels a high G impact, it will set it off. A personal locator beacon, you keep on your person mm -hmm. and they normally have to be manually activated. Okay. Um, so much of a muchness, but yeah, d different sort of yeah. ways of using them. Okay. So pros then, I think let's talk about um, the kind of ballistic parachute thing first. I think that is great. I mean, if you were to have a serious flight control failure or even a structural failure, rather than just the, you know, everyone thinks of failures, engine failure being the worst outcome. I don't think that is, you know, you're still a glider. But if you had a structural failure, like a, a wing fell off, right, they, a parachute could save your life. Yeah. You know, so I, I think that's great. You know, if a wing falls off and you've got no parachute, you, you're just dead. It's as simple as that, you know. So um, I, I think that's great, you know, and I think that's something that we'll probably see coming in more and more uh, later on. Um, obviously, the Sky Echo collision avoidance again is, is 
better than just having a pair of eyes and ears to listen out for traffic and things. Um, so the pros really, you know, we've got um, with the PLB and ELT as well, we've got increased likelihood of survival in an accident. We've got increased likelihood of being found in an emergency as well. So if you've got one of those devices uh, and you haven't managed to transmit a message, for example, or squawk, then you've you've got this emergency signal. Yes, I mean they're actually mandatory now. I think that's they, worth, yeah, that's worth mentioning. Yeah, but um, yeah, yeah, the the ELTs are good because obviously they're fitted to the aircraft. Yeah, and they'll tend to set themselves off on their own. Yeah. So cons then. So for all of these systems, it's extra training, extra complexity. Um, with the parachute specifically, that that adds weight to the aircraft. So I imagine it's considerable. I would think so. Yeah. And that's going to reduce your usable load. So, you know, obviously uh, that might decrease the range of the aircraft. We actually, we were talking about the aircraft the student bought for their training the other day. And with all that equipment on board, it actually has a very low usable load. It does, it? yeah. Yeah, well, with full fuel, we worked out with full fuel and, um, you know, it can just about take two of us. Yeah, it's quite considerable. Um, next thing is accidental deployment of these things. So... I went in an aircraft recently that's got an ELT that we have and it's an like you said earlier about the, that particular aircraft it's an unguarded switch so oh they they terrify me the ELT so yeah. you have if, if for any of the listeners who haven't seen them it's yeah. usually just a normal rocker switch it's just red that, yeah it's <laughs> sometimes guarded sometimes yeah. not and if you lean down and knock that you, yeah. you're in all sorts of trouble um they terrify me yeah um so you've got accidental deployment or activation and the, the last thing, which I didn't really consider, but you kind of touched on it, is if you got into trouble and let's say, uh, I don't know, you you became unconscious. So say you had a, I don't know, from the structural... Well, it's, it's, it's sort of highly likely. So yeah. if you have a situation where, you know, you've got loss of control or something like yeah. that, very quickly you're probably going to lose consciousness because of the G-forces. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of these, to my knowledge, um, a lot of these parachute systems, these ballistic systems, have to be manually activated. Yeah. Um, and you've got no way of doing that. So that that was a big one I thought of, because in that sort of situation where you'd need it, which really is going to be a loss of control situation, mm. you're either going to be unconscious because of the G or pinned down. So, yeah. for example, the Cirrus, I know that it's on the roof. Yeah, you might not be able to reach to activate it. To activate and you might not be able to reach that. Yeah. Um, so I wonder that if they have I any had. kind of G triggering where if it reaches an unacceptable level of G, it might. I don't it. know. Um, yeah. I'm not aware that it does, but I, I don't know. So that would be interesting to find out. Hmm. Um, another thing I'd add about, uh, about those, we sort of said about accidental deployment and weight, is the fact that... Um, these ballistic systems, you're literally sat on solid rocket fuel when you're on the ground. Yes, yeah, um, that's true. So, yeah, that's, that's an interesting thought. Okay. So, next thing really is equipment. So, it's like supplementary equipment you bring into the cockpit, such as mobile phones and other recording equipment. Okay. So, this is something that I'm kind of adding to as we go, because I know you're looking at that thinking he hasn't mentioned mobile phones yet, but I just wanted to add it in. So GoPros are a big thing now. People are um, bringing GoPros in, requesting to film flights and that kind of stuff. Um, everybody seems to take mobile phones up when they're flying. So that there were advantages to these. So I think the pros of taking a mobile phone, obviously, if you get into trouble, you can call somebody. If you have a radio fader or something like that, you could potentially call somebody. You can use SkyDemon on your phone if you need to. Um, and you can take photos of your flights if you want to, but obviously... Please make sure somebody else is flying the aircraft while you're doing that. Um, somebody qualified to do so as well. And with the GoPros, it gives you the ability to film your flight and watch back any mistakes that you have so you can reflect on it. Um, but there are some significant cons to these things, in my opinion. So first thing is they can be a huge distraction in flight. You know, if, you're, if you haven't put your phone on um, aeroplane mode, for example, 
and you're a busy type of person who gets a lot of phone calls, a lot of messages, you can have all these notifications pinging off, which can interfere with the radio as well. So you can hear that horrible bzz, 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 bzz noise on the radio. Yeah, do, 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 do. yeah, all that stuff. So that that is just not good. Then you're worrying about what it is that they're messaging you and people start reading text messages, all that kind and of stuff. My story. phone's just started ringing, funnily enough. Has it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, you know, you don't want to be answering bloody text messages and phone calls when, when you're in flight. Uh, the cameras can be a distraction as well. Um, and, and then you've got the mountings of these things. So you want a phone mount in there, you want a camera mount. These things are not um, certified mounts. You know, a lot of them are just stuck on with sticky pads or sucker mounts. These things can come off. In fact, I had, it's a true story, I had um, an incident when I was recording a flight. I was with a, an instructor and I came in, I left base for Coventry and my GoPro fell off and ended up in my footwell. So, you know, I asked that instructor to take control of the aircraft where I fished around with my feet to get this camera and pull it up back to, to get it out of the way. Yeah, imagine that on your own. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly that. You know, imagine that on your own and then worst case, it gets kind of stuck in the pedals or something like that. It's just mm. it's just a recipe for disaster. So, so yeah, make sure they're securely mounted, preferably somewhere where they're not going to interfere with any controls if they do fall off. And then there's the, the whole thing about cables in the cockpit. You know, I've seen people that are setting up their aircraft, you know, and including flights I've done, to be fair, where... You've got several cameras in there. You've got iPads, all that kind of stuff. You've got stuff on charge. You've got cables everywhere. It's just, it literally is, can be, you know, could be a recipe. It also adds considerable amounts of preparation time. So if you're on a lesson, for example, and you're wanting to record your flight lesson, don't turn up for your normal slot to get briefed because that's, that's for your lesson. That is to teach you how to fly. So if you want to record all this stuff, you need to allow extra time to go and set up the aircraft to do that so that you can focus primarily on what you're supposed to be doing. You know, recording second, it doesn't matter. If that doesn't work out, it's tough, you know. Mm. Um, so we get people obsessed with these cameras and things, and it just becomes a distraction. You don't want to be flying along thinking, oh, I need to check my camera. Is the camera working? Is the camera working? You know, quite honestly, I don't give a your camera stunts working right the you know the, the flight safety is the primary thing okay um and worst case let's say that you did something it could be good or bad you could consider this a pro or a con if you've got something on camera and you're a qualified pilot and you go and you know bust airspace whatever you do whatever the problem is you've got it on camera and it might be used as evidence um or that could help you you know, if, if you had an incident and it wasn't your fault, that might go positively in your favour. But you just have to be aware it could be used against you or to assist you. So these are just a few considerations when you're thinking about bringing technology into the cockpit. I think generally um, the advancement in technology is moving in the right direction. Um, certainly some of these safety features are just, you know, they, they, they're just great. You know, parachutes, things like that. I think it's a good idea. Um, so in summary, we feel that technology is is good, but I think the key thing really, and I think you'll agree with me on this, Steve, is make sure that you've got, you've learned and practiced the raw skills, never uses technology in replacement for the raw skills. Well, that's it. I mean, that's what's at risk here. Um, so it, it's reliance on the technology and you use your situational awareness. I mean, there's... Um, uh, a, a very, very famous, um, you know, airliner disaster that just shouldn't have happened. Yeah. Because they were so reliant on technology that they didn't recognise a stall. Oh, that was the, uh, was it Air France? It was Air France, yeah, yeah 447, yeah. 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 Um, and, and that was that. They just lost those raw skills. Mm. And these are, you know, experienced guys. Yeah. Uh, they were very experienced, in fact. So, yeah, uh, you know, if that can happen to someone like that then you know your ppl holds who flies fairly regularly mm. um you know it, it can easily happen so yeah practice your raw skills and i'd say go with an instructor every yeah. now and again um you know and just have them sit there not necessarily instructing you yeah you know and just making sure you've still got those skills yeah absolutely so i think the key thing is like if you're going to use sky demon as a specific example it's like we said before, plan it manually, check it with Sky Demon. Take a, if you're going to use the Sky Demon plug, which is fine to use, 
bring it in the aircraft with you so you've got a paper plug because that means then if your battery runs out it overheats or whatever you can still pick up the chart which you took because it's a legal requirement which you've then drawn your route onto because you should because it's good practice and you can go back to your chart and say well i'm here because i know my last position um, and i can just follow this plug as i would do normally anyway you know don't use it as a primary means of navigation um next thing is make sure you understand how to operate any technology that you bring into the cockpit on the ground thoroughly yeah and you can't stress this one enough yeah. you know if you can't use it it gets um pretty stressful i mean i i had when i was doing my ppl i yeah. bought a fancy new stopwatch just a stopwatch um had a few functions on it and yeah on a solo i got lost because of that yeah, you know, that's I, concentrating that there's a stopwatch so you imagine you know something what, more I, complicated than that I'm laughing, but it's happened to me as well. I didn't get lost because of it, but I got quite stressed because of a stopwatch once. Yeah. <laughs> it's easily done. And that was the same thing. It looked great, but then I kept pressing the wrong button and it, was re you know, it wasn't restarting. And then I was getting past my waypoint and I was getting stressed. And it just happens, doesn't it? But you imagine someone with a lot more features on, like even yeah, Sky yeah. Demon or something yeah, like yeah. that, you know. Yeah, it is. And, and, and then I think also, if you're flying an aircraft that's got equipment fitted and you don't know how to use it, get somebody to show you how to use it on the ground thoroughly you know it's like we've got that 172 word um sidewell and people are saying oh it's got autopilot i don't need to know how to use that because i'm not going to use it well what happens is if it comes on by accident mm. you know how do you turn it off for a start um you know that all these things you need to understand if it's fitted know how to use it and know what the redundancy is and what the failures are yeah so i mean from an examiner point of view you need to know how to operate everything on the aircraft really yeah yeah and I think that's where the um, we're saying about bringing technology and we're saying about the steeper learning curve. If you go and learn on an aircraft with autopilot, like the Pipistrelle, it's got autopilot, it's got G3X, it's got negative flap, it's got air brakes, it's got all kinds of stuff on it. You need to know how to use every single one of those things so that A, you can use it correctly, operate it correctly, but B, if it goes wrong, you know what it's doing. Yeah. So, so there's your steeper learning curve straight away. If you get into a 152, there's far less to know about because it's just a simpler aircraft. Um, so we're still a believer that simp simple is better, but technology... Certainly know. for learning. Yeah. Just to wrap it up, um, yeah, technology is great, providing you know how to, to use it, um, and just get some guidance with it. But I think um, it would be funny, actually, just to share a couple of our stories about technology in the cockpit and how it could be potentially a distraction so i don't know where you want to go first steve yeah so i, I was um yeah a little while ago ferrying a um a g1000 equipped aircraft yeah um you know and it got uh, all sorts of technology in it and uh you know flying along my own business i programmed it all up and it was just following the route on what we call l nav mode lateral navigation so it's following it um and i'm just sitting there monitoring it and then all of a sudden, an aircraft just shoots underneath me really quite close. Yeah. And I was really annoyed myself because I felt I just got complacent. Yeah. You know, I, I, yeah. I'll be honest, I wasn't looking out. It had ACAS in it. Um, so traffic um, airborne collision avoidance system. Um, and for whatever reason, that aircraft didn't come up on it. Presumably right. didn't have his transponder on. And yeah, I was just really annoyed with myself because, you know, I was sitting there being being quite complacent, really. Mm. Um so that was a big learning curve for me. Yeah, I, I had, uh, this is a very basic thing, but it goes back to the mobile phone thing and about how they can be um, a distraction in flight. And this was when I was a solo student um, and I took my mobile phone because I wanted to take pictures uh, to show everybody, oh, I'm out flying, da, 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 stick it on Instagram like everybody does. And um, anyway, my phone, after about a couple of photos, ran out of memory. And I'm sat there thinking, oh, I've just got to fly this straight line for a bit. So I'm sat there <laughs> deleting photos oh, to, <laughs> to make room to, to put more photos on. So I am looking at where I'm going. But my actual awareness of where I'm going for a few minutes, right, was completely distracted by the fact that all I could think about was getting rid of some photos so I could say to everybody on Instagram, look what I did today. Um, and I know that that stuff happens other than you know to other people and just me say please 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 if you take this stuff in the cockpit right just remember you've still got a job to do right yeah. you've still got to fly this airplane that becomes the primary job above anything right and that's why if you're going to take this stuff just put it on airplane mode do what you're going to do throw it in the back whatever 
but you know don't don't do that so yeah i think we'll wrap it up i think that was an interesting chat anyway and it just gives you a brief idea of you know the pros and cons to some of the technology you can bring in the cockpit or stuff that's already fitted to the aircraft and please you know embrace technology but just make sure you know how to use it so thanks for listening and please like and subscribe to the channel and uh, yeah we'll see you on the next episode if you like this episode please like subscribe and ding the bell to receive notifications of the next episode